Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. What, what about you and you, your you know, reading of the, of the book of Ezra? What's standing out to you? Well, so I've gone to just a couple different sources, some things it's easy to go to. Um, and the source I like is the Bible Project. Some of those videos, they're very quick to get a quick overview of the book. We recommend those to our leaders, uh, to our leaders, to our listeners to kind of go through. And in seven minutes, you can get a YouTube video that gives you a nice overview of the, any book of the Bible, seven to nine minutes. Um, and then that that source, the Bible Project, also has deeper content that they have on their website that you can go get more detail about different books of the Bible and I'm not vouching for everything theologically that they stand for. I don't know everything that they stand for, but um, but it's a pretty good resource. And uh, then I go to another resource I often go to, preceptaustin.org, which compiles a lot of different commentaries. But one of the things that Bible Project he was pointing out is that these restorations, they, they go back to the temple and Zebrabel rebuilds a temple. And then Ezra goes back you know, 50 years later to rebuild the community. They don't go so well. They don't end so well. They're kind of anticlimactic endings for each of them. You know, that it doesn't the um doesn't work out. Did did you notice that or did you in your prep, Craig? Did you see that? That the because sometimes you see these things, there's like these these books are held up as examples for like Christian leadership. This is what a successful ministry campaign looks like. And so, hey, we're launching the new building campaign of the church. We're gonna go to Ezra and Nehemiah and quote that and sort of draw lessons about how to do this new building campaign. And you know, we're doing for, for our fundraising and for the whole thing, and we're mapping it out. We're going to look at inspiration for these great uh, campaigns. And then he says, "Yeah, you could do that, but you got to read the whole thing to the end because they don't they don't actually go that well." And there's some real spiritual failure wrapped up in each of these. Um, some disappointment um, with the uh, temple that it's done, and um, that the people who were alive remember that. Say it's not like the old one. It's not like God's presence has really filled it. Um, there's opposition along the way, and then, and uh, people, I guess, that in the when Zerubbabel Bell first goes back, that those 50,000 people come back out of exile seven years later. But there were people still living that hadn't gone to exile that want to help. And he says, No, you can't help. And so the community is not really rebuilt. There's some real anticlimactic kind of things that don't seem to go so well with the first effort. Yeah. So, I, is that something you keyed in on when you're looking at it? That take on it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that we we see that um, we've seen that over and over again in in the Bible. It is kind of interesting what you said because Nehemiah, for example, the book of Nehemiah is constantly used as a book of leadership, like you know, right. um, great leadership principles, and and you could pull out things like that in the first six chapters of of uh, Ezra too about like um, how leaders are going to face opposition. Because when they were rebuilding the, the Temple Mount. Um, yep. God uses ordinary people to accomplish his purposes. People just pick up a hammer and join in. And there's, yeah, there's good, some principles there, right? Uh, everyone gets involved. But it's not like it, it doesn't restore the kingdom. I mean, I think that part of it is, um, and again, I'm, this is some things I'm getting from the some of the Bible Project resources, that there's a huge sense of hope. Like finally, the, the prophecy from Jeremiah is going to be fulfilled. You went through all these exile, and now finally the, you know, the, the promise is going to return. We're going to rebuild the temple, and then eventually going to rebuild the community, rebuild the walls in the book of Nehemiah, and it's going to be great again. It's all going to be like, you know, fantastic and great. And it's not. It's not. You know, the second right. half, there's a, there's a, he sees all this uh, intermarriage and clamps down on that, and there's that kind of weird story of the mass divorces. Um. That yeah. uh, it, it's, it's so. It, it, I mean, I, does that? I don't know if you were going to touch on that or go on that because that the, the, the commentator points out, like, well, that's you know, they were intermarrying with some of the locals, and that wasn't what God wanted. But the doing the mass divorces wasn't what necessarily what God wanted either, you know. Um, and that doesn't necessarily doesn't end gloriously or wonderfully with oh, now you have 
the lion lying down with the lamb and this new rebuilt Jerusalem. It's all peace and prosperity and everyone's walking with God and and they're not. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was heartbreaking for Ezra, um, um, you know, that when uh, when he discovered that, that the inter intermarriages and yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I think that the whole the book actually ends with a list of all the people um, that were um, that had intermar intermarried with uh, with people uh, and, yeah. and and separated from them. By the way, I wanted uh, I meant what I was talking about Esther. I want to fact check myself here. Esther is most likely King Artaxerxes' mother in law. Mother in law. Mother in law. Yeah. Okay. So Artaxerxes was not her grandson. Um, she was his mother in law. Um, um, so anyway, there's some. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And so what I, I, I get it. I'm not, I'm no expert. Like I said, I want to study more with you. And it's like they, you know, they re go back, rebuild the temple. And it's going to be great. And then Ezra comes back seven, 50 years later and they haven't been walking with the Lord. They've been drifting, you know, and not really. So then he climbs down on them and does this kind of, but then he goes overboard with this mass divorce thing. He said, I think it's overboard. Yeah. Yeah. And then the book finishes with the list of those who are guilty of their idolatrous marriages. It's right. like a genealogy of negativity. <laughs> yeah, right. It reminds you of uh, uh, the Scarlet Letter, right? And it feels like the book ends abruptly, but I think that that's because really, you know, Nehemiah is the next, Nehemiah is the next book. And I think it's very possible these were all written on one scroll and we're, we're the ones who separated them into these um uh, you know, into separate Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, Chronicles. Right. Um, yeah, I read that too. The Nehemiah, because Nehemiah is the same pattern of like, you know, Persian king sends him out. Um, he faces opposition and then it ends with anti-climax. And we're not here tonight to talk about Nehemiah, but he's also at the end really distressed that they're not following the Lord and he's pulling people's hair out, you know, because uh, people are unfaithful and so you you know you're in ministry, Greg. What do you take from that? Like you know these people are they meant well? They were passionate for the Lord for the cause. Is it just that you know they were dealing with flawed people that let them down, and that's a lesson for Christian leaders? Is like, look, your your people will always let you down. Is that the lesson? I don't I I don't know. I mean, that's there's a lot of truth to that. Um, it, it's it is interesting, you know, as we as we're walking through the Old Testament, how we see so few like um heroes yeah uh, you know sure. i mean ezra in the book of ezra he comes across as kind of a hero um, right but like i said he's a very humble hero he's 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 uh he's he's heartbroken over when he discovers you know that the people weren't living for the lord and they were intermarrying and um, they weren't devoted. There's there was a need for there was a great need for spiritual revival, um, and I think it actually comes in in Nehemiah. Uh, mm. um, but um, but he Ezra plants the seeds. He kind of sets the stage for this spiritual revival. Um, well, you know, maybe one point, Greg. I don't know. This is why we have these podcasts where we batter on ideas as they kind of, as we read the word together and try to understand it and hopefully this, have the spirit guide us. But lots of people sit around now and complain about the church. I mean, there, you know, we've talked about podcasts about what's happening in evangelical Christianity in America and what's wrong with it. And it's it just, you don't need that. You go to, just go to your average church and walk out and people will be criticizing the pastor on the way out. It's really everywhere. It's really easy to say, well, I didn't like that sermon today. Well, I didn't like the music and I didn't like this and I didn't like that. And it's really easy, easy to criticize your Christian leaders. They're not leading us in a spirit filled way, the way I would like to be led. But the reality is it's true. They're your Christian leaders are sinners, right? They're right. flawed people. Even if they're like heartfelt trying to follow the Lord, they're still going to mess up because they're just really flawed. But so are you all of us, even the ones of us that are, 
believers, we're going to church. We got to remember, we're only here by his grace, right? Absolutely. Not, we're not here because we're good people. We're here because we're sinners that were saved. Um, so um, we all need grace. It's uh, maybe that's maybe that's a takeaway from these things because they don't they're not glorious stories of restoration of Israel. Like it's it's they're almost disappointing stories. Right. Yeah. So one of the things I always like to uh, think about is how do we see Jesus in the book of Ezra? I was going to ask you, how did, so, so wait, wait, back, back up. Greg, how do we see Jesus in the book of Ezra? Well, I'm still, I'm still wrestling with that. I'm still trying to figure that out, but I think that maybe um, you see Jesus because Jesus offers us hope and a new beginning. Okay. And so the restoration of Jerusalem in the book of Ezra offers a message of hope and a new beginning for the Jewish people. Even though it went imperfectly, like we were just talking about, it still gave the Jewish people hope and a new start. And like when they built the Temple Mount, they said that the like there was cheering and crying happening at the same time. Right. People were weeping because they hadn't seen, you know, um, just just they were you know filled with uh so much joy um, yeah except the other take was they were weeping because it was not like god's spirit appeared the way it was before they remember like before when god's spirit actually descended on we could see it yeah like it's not happening it's not it's not that great so the yeah, weeping the temple the temple was not like solomon's temple and and um it was even yeah. kind of plain, wasn't it there was some some verse i'm reading was like the ornamentation wasn't quite as, it wasn't quite as nice Definitely, definitely not. Yeah. But there was just like this amazing uh, pour out of emotion. And, That's true. Uh, That's true. No matter um, what. So um, I don't know. I mean, it, what, what are some other ways you see Jesus in the book of Ezra? Um, Jesus always identifies with the outcasts and the marginalized. And you, and you could say that the Jewish people were, had been marginalized, you know, and outcast because they were exiled right um so this this shows that you know he um you know it hasn't forgotten about them right. he has a plan for them um um i don't i you know uh, other than that you know the 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 book is it's so much of it is historical just about the ultimate fulfillment of the restoration of Jerusalem, which is, which is significant, right? Because it fulfilled prophecy. Right. So. Um, yeah. You know. So this is something. Um, right. But it still didn't really solve the problem because the real problem is the sinfulness in the human heart. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just like when Jesus was around that people thought, you know, he's going to finally restore us, throw, kick out the Romans and restore us to like, a be a political savior and make our lives better. Right. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm here to do. The real problem is the sin in your heart. You need to, you know, and there's an exile metaphor there too. You're real, you're separated from the Lord. What you really need is this, this, this reconnection with him through Jesus. And that's not going to happen by making your circumstances better. It's not going to happen by restoring your physical buildings like the temple. It's not going to happen by getting rid of the Romans and making, giving you a political solution. You need a restoration, wholesale restoration of your heart, which is a much bigger restoration. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's what you need. Maybe another way you see Jesus in the book of Ezra is maybe Ezra himself is sort of a type of Christ. Oh, how so? Well, no, because Ezra, it says Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord. Hmm. And, and and Jesus, you know, definitely did that as a child, but he also is the living word. <laughs> um, and, and then it says not just to study it, but to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in, in Israel. Hmm. Hmm. And Jesus was proclaiming the word of God. Like, I mean, he was the living word. So I, I don't know. That might be a little bit of a stretch, but um that's interesting. Yeah. 
you know, Ezra came to bring spiritual renewal to the people. That was like his mission. And, and Jesus's mission was similar. Right. Um, right. But, it, but so much greater. Right. Um, he came to bring not just spiritual renewal, but salvation to, to all people. Right. So. It was definitely a spiritual awakening. I mean, Ezra was coming to really awaken them, you know, right, kind of wake out of their slumber and give them spiritual awareness. So they could see that they're, they're sin and come back to repentance. And he was doing this in the midst of like, it, it doesn't seem, it, it seems like he was, um, I, I don't know it he seems to be the point person yeah you know that the spiritual leader like he didn't have uh you know you don't hear other other people he's the one who led the led the israelites in in repentance in chapter nine um i mean he prays he says oh my god i'm ashamed and blush to lift my face to you my god for the iniquities, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. Hmm. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt, and our iniquities, we, our kings, and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame, as it is today. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place. So anyway. Um, keep going, because going, I was going to ask you what your favorite verse was in the whole book. And you, you stopped right before mine. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, verse Ezra, you're in reading, just for our listeners, you're reading in Ezra 9. But Ezra 9, verse 9, and my, I'm reading in the NIV, so you can tell me what yours says. Mine says, though we were slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. Yeah, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And yeah. now... Oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands and with, the, and with their abom abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanliness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters uh, for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, seeing that you, O oh God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consume us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just for we are left for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt. For none of us can stand before you because of this. You know, Ezra here, he identifies with the, uh, I don't think Ezra intermarried with anybody, but he puts himself, he, he you know, he can, can he, he continues to identify with the sinners, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things I, one of the things I really like about the book of Ezra, there's several times where it says the hand of God was on Ezra. Hmm. The hand of the Lord was on him. Mm. And again, that reminded me of Jesus, you know, um, how Jesus, you know, um, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, and here he is identifying with sinners and uh, repenting kind of, you know, for them. 
But your favorite verse was which one? Five verse nine, but I also like 13. And so um, 13 says, what has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved. And I and uh, and it goes on and and uh, but that's the 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 relevant part. You have punished us less than our sins deserved. And this whole section, when he's reflecting on this, is like this is a clear sighted, you know, view of history. In other words, you could say every one of us has like a lens through which we look at our circumstances, a lens through which we look at history. We have biases and all the rest. And this is like a moment when this all the scales fall off. And he's saying, I'm going to give you a completely clear sight of view of what has happened to us in our history. The bad things that have happened to us are clearly a result of our sin, not for not for anything else, right? We 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 have done these things, and that that's why we went into exile. And yet God, he, he, God punished us, but even less than our sins deserved. Yeah, it's a whole view of human nature saying what we really deserve is far worse than this. We, well, we if we if we got justice, what we really deserve, we, we we get death and hell, death and hell. That's what we really deserve. And he's, and what we did get is not because he was bad to us or God was unfaithful or God was mean or anything else. It's because we really deserved it. That is clear sighted view of the human condition, what God, God's justice. And it says here, verse 15, uh, again, we're reading from Ezra 9, verse 15. O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. You're the righteous one. We're the flawed ones. That is that is so clear-sighted in its yes. view of God, mankind, and history, right? Um, it's just amazing. You know, I was just talking to someone who's uh, telling me they were listening to, like, uh, 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 uh history podcast about nuclear weapons and talking about nuclear weapons and how, and the, and the conclusion or the thought was from the podcast broadcaster was, have, have we as a human species evolved enough from an evolutionary bio, biological perspective to be able to handle power such as nuclear weapons? And it's just an evolutionary biology thing. And and um, and part of it was saying things like, well, you know, if Genghis Khan had nuclear weapons, do you think he would have used them? If Adolf Hitler had nuclear weapons, do you think? Do you, if Caesar had, do you think they would have used them? And the answer most people would say is rhetorically to those rhetorical questions is, yes, oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. And the Christian answer in, in, in is understanding say human nature is hopelessly flawed. It is we are sinners, and the denial of that is astonishing. You say no, 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 no. We are. We're just. It's evolutionary biology. We're getting better and better all the time. And we're just progressing. And while now we have the ability to blow up the entire world and blow ourselves up, we may not have the ability to handle that just yet. But if we given enough time, as a species, we're progressing. And I think this, this clear-sighted answer, Ezra, of nothing else, says, baloney. <laughs> the human condition is that we have rebelled against God. For that, we completely deserve death and hell. God is being nice to us by not giving us everything we deserve, right? And he, and he, when he makes those judgments, is completely righteous when he judges, judges. And we don't have a leg to stand on. Anything we have is by pure mercy and grace. So a very different take on the human condition, all of history. And I think, I keep using this word, but exceptionally clear-sighted on the part of Ezra here in Ezra 9. Yeah, I love that. And that ties right in with... Uh our whole, uh, you know, passion for gospel-driven sanctification. Amen. Makes um, me a gospel addict, Greg. Yeah, right, right. So when well, it says, when verse 9 says we are slaves, do you think they're just talking about being slaves in Babylon? Or do you think it's even a, a slave to sin? I think it's a deeper meaning. That, that's the way I was taking it. Is we, are, we are in a bondage to our sin. Right. He's like, we are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery. But he has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of yeah. I mean, that's a gospel verse right there. Yeah, I think it is a temp it's, it's two double layers of meaning because he probably yeah. is referring to their bondage and the they're taken into exile. They were slaves, you know, they're uh, because of military conquest. Right. Yeah. But um, then I mean, but then he definitely, yeah, there's yeah, but then as the prayer goes on, he definitely brings up how 
they've fallen into sin themselves. Yeah. And well, look, we'll read, read in verse nine, the, the whole thing. It's it's a it's a parallel metaphor for the way God, the Father, the real God has treated us. He's saying we were slaves. God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He, meaning God, showed us has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He granted us new life, new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruin. And he's given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. So the same way the king of Persia, through just unprompted sheer grace and mercy, allowed us to leave our bondage and come back and rebuild Jerusalem. In the same way, our father through has no obligation to do this whatsoever. Completely unmerited favor, right? But that is the definition of grace. Something you're doing, something with it that you have no obligation to do whatsoever. That's what the father, that's what God does for us. There's no obligation to just, you know, it's like Cyrus announcing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice to you and give you this. And the Father does the same for us. Gets nothing out of it. Had nothing he didn't have before. There's no obligation to do it. It's sheer grace that Cyrus and, the, and these other king, Persian kings did this for them. It's sheer grace that the Father does saves saves us. I love that. I love I love the uh, your your thoughts on verse 13 too, chapter nine, verse 13, that. Uh, He's God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Yeah, and how that is that is something that all of us as believers should meditate on. Let me tell you a quick story that makes me think about. I may have told you this story before, but a friend of mine, some of our listeners may know this individual. So, I, but a, a friend of mine is close friends. A friend of mine is Catholic. He's friends with a Catholic priest who um, is also a TV personality. It was in New York watching a parade and got spit on. And someone said, wow, because uh, he was wearing his, you know, I guess, priestly yeah. uh, fires. Someone spit on him. And they said, wow, how does it make you feel? You know, and think he'd be like, you know, all filled with anger. And and uh, he said, well, it's it had just an incredible gospel-driven response. It was beautiful. It was perfect. It was something that he said something at that moment i think i would never have thought to say that at the moment i would have thought of it 30 minutes later but never at the moment they said well you know how does it make you feel you just got spit on he said it's better than i deserve wow i know that's a guy who gets the gospel it's right? better than i deserve it's better than i deserve Man. you know somebody just just spit on you in uh new york city i thought that was amazing an amazing testimony of grace Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.